So then, then we have the final to worry about, and uh, I will try to have a practice, uh, practice, practice exam. It will be mostly what uh, we did lately. So magnetism, most most magnetism, and uh, what we are doing now. Now it's going to be uh, mostly conceptual, except for that part here. I want to go back to because I don't think I was clear, so I failed. It's okay. It's part of life. So I want to go back to that. So we talk about electromagnetic waves, right? And we say that an electromagnetic wave, like any wave, you have something that has to shake. So in the case of an electromagnetic wave, you have an electric field shaking. And at the same time, you have a magnetic field shaking. And they both induce each other. So electric field induce magnetic field, they induce electric field, and so forth and so on. And each time you have a wave, of course, you're going to have the speed. And the speed of the wave is the wavelength times the frequency. In addition to that, any wave has to carry energy. It depends, in the case of the electromagnetic wave, of course, it's going to depend on the frequency. For the same volume, you're going to have more energy if you have a gamma ray uh, radiation. Or if you have a long, long radio wave, radio wave does not carry as much energy as X-ray radiation carry, which makes sense, right? You know that UV carries energy because it can burn. Infrared carries energy because you can feel the heat. So just to illustrate what I'm saying now, I uh, just want to show you a demonstration. And you, you all are familiar with infrared lamp. Maybe you have a red tie, like I have a, not me, but my son, but I'm taking care of it, like a gecko. They, they need infrared lamp sometimes because they don't like humidity. I don't know what they are doing in Florida. I don't think it's, a, they, you know, they are, um, they come from Afghanistan, the, the leopard gecko. So I'm not sure that Florida is great for them. So anyway, if you have an infrared, you can use also infrared for physical therapy, for example. It's like a heat lamp for many things. And uh, so, you know, it's carrying energy. So that's the point I want to make. Before so I'm going to show you that infrared heat you feel at a campfire so is really is an nice, electromagnetic uh, wave. And we're going to do it by showing that it obeys the laws of optics. So here's a parabolic mirror with a really hot filament right at the focus. So that's emitting the infrared radiation. And whenever you have an optical source at the focus of a parabolic mirror like this, it comes out as a collimated beam. So I have a collimated beam of infrared radiation here. And I can actually feel it. It's very hot when I put my hand here. So it's very interesting. So he has a source here, infrared source. But the radiation, instead of spreading in three dimension, it's very much guided, right? So it doesn't spread in space. It doesn't lose its energy. All that energy that you have here, it's gonna the move at the speed of light here, and it's gonna be collected here at the center. Okay, so you don't see the, the, the infrared, but actually it's moving here at the speed of light and it's being collected there. It doesn't spread in space. I feel nothing when I put my hand up here because it's not in the beam. There's clearly a beam. So this beam goes to the second mirror. So this is also a parabolic mirror. It's well aligned. It's taking all that infrared radiation and focusing it to a point right in the middle. So that's a very hot place to be. Huge amount of infrared radiation being focused to a point. So to show you how hot it is, I am going to use it to light a cigarette. So this is my, now I can't, I don't want to hold my hand in there. I don't want to burn myself. So this is my steampunk opera length cigarette lighter that I made specifically for this purpose. And I'm going to hold it in there and we'll see if it lights. Let's see, got to get it where it's really hot. And it usually takes a while. Okay, we're smoldering a little. And it's starting to taste terrible. When it tastes terrible, it means I'm close. <laughs> okay, so it worked. Enough heat to light the side of a cigarette. So, so the point is that the source is here and you have radiation. 
right? And you have energy inside that radiation. That's what, what is the math I want to get to, right? And here you can focus all the radiation, all the energy at a very small point. So it's going to say smoking is bad for you, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, we get it. So I want to go back to the math because I think it was not clear. And um, you see you have those infrared lamps. So here you have physical therapy. But you see that here you do not have a parabolic uh, lamp. So it means the, the radiation tends to spread out, such as when you get to that distance here, for the same area, you are not collecting the same amount of radiation. Does that make sense to you? So about the math. So the math I was trying to explain last time is that if you take here yeah, imaginary, okay, if you take a cube, so that's a volume here, right? One meter by one meter by one meter, okay? So it's one, one volume. So you, you take a little, uh, you cut out a volume here, a unit volume. So this is a unit volume. Just mean that it's one meter here, one meter, one meter. Then the average energy that you can find inside that cube here that you cut out inside the radiation, that's going to be this energy here. So what we call U here in my slide, this is the average, it's an average energy. So the average energy of the radiation per, per unit volume. Okay, so it's the average energy found inside the radiation per unit volume. And of course, it depends for the same volume which kind of radiation you are talking about. If you are talking about radio wave, even though they have the same speed, they're not going to have the same amount of energy locked inside the, in, in uh, electric field and, and magnetic field. And then we discuss that you have a relationship between E and B, the electric field and the magnetic field. And we're talking about the RMS. So don't, don't worry too much about it. Is that if you remember when we talk about AC, when I used my voltmeter, I was reading 120 volt AC, which is actually the, uh, it's some kind of average. I was reading that, remember, I almost died for you, you know, sacrifice my life to science. But actually, AC means that the voltage goes up and down, right? And the maximum is actually 170 volts. So 120 volts is just some kind of average. So in that case, the electric field also is a sine wave going up and down, and we are just taking some kind of average here, right? And uh, last time we talked how the RMS or the electric field equals C, the speed of flight times the magnetic field. So you have a relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field. And we say that the C is what we call the speed of flight, three times 10 to the eight meter per second, okay? <laughs> and C, the speed of light is also the wavelength times the frequency. C is constant. So if I try to trick you for next pop quiz, we don't have a pop quiz uh, today, but Tuesday, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to try to trick you. I'm going to say, oh, gamma ray, you know, they're going to have to be faster than radio wave. No, they don't. They have the same speed, okay? It's just that they have more energy. They carry more energy because they have more frequency. We're going to see that the, the, the energy of electromagnetic wave depends on the frequency. So if you increase the frequency, if you go from radio wave to gamma ray, then the wavelength has to decrease. Okay, we already discussed that. Here you see the wavelength is smaller, the frequency is higher, the wavelength is larger, but the frequency is smaller. Okay. So we discussed that. What else did we discuss? We say that the, the speed of light equals one over the square root of epsilon zero 
mu zero. Mu zero is a constant that you find when you deal with uh, magnetism, static magnetic field. Mu zero is four pi times 10 to the negative seven. Epsilon zero is the constant that you have when dealing with static electric fields. And remember, it's something like this. It's, it's in your, uh, it's in your um, equation sheet. There is a four here, pi. And whatever the units are. Okay. So you, you have this relationship. Okay. My point is that if you cut out a unit volume inside the radiation, you're going to have this expression here. And this term here is the same thing as this one. Okay. And you, if you ask why, why, that's because E equals CB. So if you substitute E by that expression, you're going to get this one. Is that more clear? So you can feel that infrared radiation carries a lot of energy. You can put your hand, you feel the heat. Yes. Mu, mu zero is the constant that you have in magnetism. Do you remember when we, we did magnetism, for example, if you have the magnetic field, you know, at the center of the loop, the magnetic field is, uh, I forgot, mu zero i over 2r or something like this. I don't, don't memorize them, but it's the constant that you, for any field that you are studying in physics, you have constant. It's like the God who created our universe decided of the constant to tune the universe the way God likes it, right? So you go to another universe, then you're going to change those constant, and then it will behave in a different manner. So the reason why we can stand, you know, on our two legs, it's because gravity is so weak. That because the constant of gravity is like um, G is uh, like 10 to the negative uh, 11. So it's, it's going to be very small relative to the electric constant. So it's, uh, it's, it's even smaller. Okay, I don't, I forgot the constant, but those constant is going to tell you, it depends on, so this constant is the magnetic constant, this constant is the electric constant. Is that clear? So if I, if I look at my equation sheet here, yeah, equation sheet here, yeah, you have mu zero, that will be for electricity, uh, static, static electricity, so electrostatic. You have K also that you can use. For magnetism, you have this um, constant here. And G, that, that's, what, that's what you use for uh, gravity, right? And that G is going to tell you that gravity is so small because it's so smaller than the one you use for static electricity. Here we have 10 to the 9, and here we have 10 to the negative 11. So that's why we are not crawling on the floor. We can stand up because gravity is so weak. If you go to uh, Jupiter, you're going to be flat. Right? So I'm taking a, tendence, uh, a tangent here, but is that clear? Does that answer your question? It's a constant uh, linked to magnetism. That's a constant linked to electricity. And that proves that you combine electricity and magnetism to, to develop electromagnetism. And uh, any electromagnetic wave will move at that speed. OK, is that clear? So that here, that here will be the energy per unit volume that you find in any radiation, any electromagnetic wave. So you see you have a wave here, it's moving at a constant uh, speed, but it's spreading out, so you are losing energy. Any question? Is that clear? Okay, so if you take, uh, let, let's go back to the problem we did last time. Here we take the sun. So the sun has also radiation. It's emitting the radiation. Okay, so it's it does does have infrared. It does have uh, visible light. All kind of radiation.
So it's in red. So it has radiation. And now that radiation is going to lose some, uh, you know, it's spreading out in three dimension. Okay. But here the question was, if I get to Earth, so I, now this is Earth here. I am on Earth, Earth atmosphere. What's going to be the energy per unit volume? that I found here next next to Earth, right? So you have radiation from the sun. What's, what's that energy here? So for that, you're going to use one of these equations. And it's giving you the, the, the electric field here. It's giving you that the electric field is 720 Newton per Coulomb. So then I can use this equation here to find how much energy I'm going to get per unit volume, okay, at that distance. Do you understand? Of course, if I move closer to the, uh, to the sun, now I cut out a small unit volume. Of course, here I'm going to find less energy because the energy spread in three dimensions. So I'm not going to get that much energy here than I get there. And, and thank God, because if, if you work here, you know, you, you will be fried. So you cannot uh, have that much of energy. So we are at the right distance that the energy is not so high that it's perfect for us. Right? It has um, perfect temperature on Earth. So that's what we did last time. So I'm not going to do it again. But we use that equation to find the energy per unit volume. Is that is that clear now? Yes. Yes, you you can uh, you can use this. You can use that equation. So if you use that equation, you 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 are missing B. Okay, the magnetic field. So how can we get the magnetic field? So in that case, you can say the magnetic field is E. Uh, divided by C. Okay, it's the same equation. Those two terms are equal to each other. So if you do half, you multiply by two, you're going to get this. So either you use this equation, or you use this equation, or you use this equation, they are all the same. This is because B equals E over C. Is that clear? So if I substitute B by E over C, I'm going to get that. If I substitute E equals B times C, I'm going to get this one. So it, it depends what is given to you. Is that clear? So this expression here is the same as that expression here is the same as this expression there. They are all the same. And, and we did that equation. We did that last time. I think uh, the, the, you do 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And then you do E square, so 720 square. So what is that? That's the energy, the energy per, per unit volume. So you are inside the Earth atmosphere. You cut out a uh, unit volume, so one meter by one meter by one meter, and you find out, you put your pizza inside and you see how it's going to cook, you know, given the amount of energy. So you find how much energy is inside that unit volume, and that's what you get. Is that clear? But it's energy per unit volume. You cut out a volume, and that's what you get. And we did that last time, yes? So what's, what's going to be the unit? Can you give me the number? I forgot. What's, what, what did we get last time? Huh? 4.58 times 10 to negative 6. So that will be joule per cubic meter. Okay? Joule per cubic meter. 
okay and then the second question was find the magnetic field so in that case the magnetic field is e divided by c because that's the relationship between them so the magnetic field is 720 divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 and the unit will be tesla okay is that clear if if you go like the experiment i just show you before like he had the parabolic uh, mirror like this and it has a source here of infrared now let me ask you something oh good for pop quiz right so he had the uh, infrared flowing are you going to find the same energy here that you find here yes because it doesn't spread out it's all guided right you are not losing anything the same energy but the sun the sun it's spreading out in three dimensions so you are not going to to get the same um, the same energy you are losing energy which is good otherwise you will be fried to death if if it was the same energy it's good that it's dilution there is dilution spreading out is that clear so if i ask you for the next pop quiz you know you have a parabolic uh, mirror and you have a source of infrared do you get the same energy here and there yes and and um, uh, actually the sound sound works exactly the same way when you sing oh you sing this you sing here you you do like in a shower you are singing and then all the sound here is going to spread in three dimension so someone far away from you it's gonna it's not going to hear the same energy it's going to be uh maybe that person is not going to hear you but when you were a kid do you remember when you were a kid like it was fun like you have a tube here and uh, like that have you done that experiment and you listen to your friend and your friend could be very very far away and and then you see the sound cannot spread out so you you are keeping the same amount of energy into your sound wave you are guiding the sound wave so you are not losing energy here for sound you can do the same thing you can take a small unit of volume here a small unit of volume find out how much energy and it's going to be the same here it's not going to be the same because we're going to talk about the inverse square law uh, energy spreading out in space does it make sense so so we did that last time but i don't think it was clear so i hope now it's uh, more clear 4.6 yes that will be joule per cubic meter and that's going to be tesla because it's a magnetic field okay so far so good so let's talk now about that physical quantity that i was trying to uh, introduce last time so that's that will be so you see how energy is flowing right it's like a, a, a water flowing that's going to be the energy flowing per unit area per unit second okay so it's not the same before it was the energy in the unit volume now here my my uh, infrared he gets a massage here so you take a unit volume here that will be the amount of energy here we are not talking about the same thing we're going to talk about the energy flowing per unit area so that's like a sensor you have a sensor here and you see how much energy is going to hit that sensor is going to flow through that physical quantity is called s and it's called the pointing vector so i'm going to explain again with an example like that example especially because i know some some people will go in uh, physical therapy so physical therapy they use infrared lamp you know infrared can go actually in inside your skin so it's very healthy 
uh, it's very good. Why, why is it very good? Because you have studies that show that infrared from the sun, for example, no, that's UV. But infrared, what it does, it, uh, it produces melatonin, melatonin in the cell. Not the melatonin that makes you sleep, that will be in the brain, but melatonin in, in your cell. So it's very good for the mit mitochondria. Mitochondria in the cell, infrared, right? So actually what they did, you know, the incandescent light bulb that we used to have, it was not a bad thing for us because it was producing infrared heat wave. So it was good for our skin. Now they are being phased out because of course it's not very energy efficient, but that means you have to go outside. You cannot stay inside because otherwise you don't get enough infrared, although you do whatever you want. I'm just uh, quoting some study. Melanin, it's infrared, infrared in, in the cell, in the blood. The, there was study about that. They even study about the infrared in, in your skull, like uh, in, it goes to your brain. I mean, it's, it's very good. It's very healthy, infrared uh, light. UV is for the vitamin D. So before we talk about cutting out a unit volume, and finding the energy, right? We, we just talked about that, and that was equals to, for example, epsilon zero, mag electric field square, or it's the same thing as one over mu zero b square. But now you see here how that radiation spread out, right? It doesn't stay, it's not guided, okay? So we can define a new physical quantity, such as we're gonna take an area here, right? So this is an area A, like a sensor, and you have another area here, let's say on the skin here. Okay, so it's flat. This is part, it's, I put that uh, area here on the skin. This is another area. I don't know how to do it in a perspective, but this is an area here and this is an area there on the skin, do, do you agree with me that here the radiation going through this area will be more than the radiation coming, going in, hitting that area? Okay, you just take an infrared lamp, you put your hand very close to it, your hand is an area, right? It's gonna be very hot, it's gonna burn you. As you move your hand away from the lamp, it's not going that hot, so it's not going to burn you. Do you agree with that? If, if Again, if you have like snake or reptile, you know, you need those lamps. So very close, it's very hot. Farther away, it's not that hot. And you use it also for massage, for example. Physical therapy, they use it, right? So we can define the quantity that we call S, and that will be the energy, the energy flowing through the area. So it's, it's radiation. Imagine it's like radiation, okay, Flo flowing through the area, or, or we could say it like this, the energy flowing, flowing per, per unit area and per, per unit second. So that means you are trying to find how much energy is flowing per unit area. So you take a sensor here, so my hand, let's say my hand is one meter per one meter, and I take my hand here one meter per one meter, and I feel the heat. So that physical quantity will be the amount of energy flowing per unit area and per unit second. And here you're gonna have, of course, less energy flowing through this area, and here you're gonna have more energy flowing per area. Is that clear? So you, again, you take a sensor, like you take your hand, let's say your hand is one meter per one meter, and the amount of radiation 
that you feel. So the amount of radiation flowing through your hand per second, per second, per area, that is S. And as you move away your hand, of course, you're going to have less radiation. So, of course, you need to, to be careful here. You don't, don't want to be sued by the patient. If you put the lamp too close to the skin, of course, you're going to burn the person. That person not going to be happy, right? So, you need to have the right distance. Okay, so the amount of radiation that you get depends on the distance. So, S, that quantity here equals C, you multiply by the speed. E square, and it's going to be the same thing as like C mu zero B square. It's going to be the same. What is important? It's going to be the unit because it's something that is flowing. So it's going to be joule, joule per unit second and per unit area. Or Joule per second, if you remember, it's watt. So watt per unit area. So S is a physical quantity that defines how much radiation is flowing every second through that area one by one. So amount of energy flowing through an area of uh, one unit area. Is that clear? That's going to be defining S. And it's like before, except you put a C in front. Okay? So that's to become quantitative. Joule per unit second per unit meter square. No, I'm not right. Watt per meter square. Oh, it's the energy flowing per unit area per unit second. It's flowing, right? So let me ask you something, pop quiz, uh, to go back to that parabolic uh, mirror here. And he was lighting his uh, cigarette. And we know smoking is bad for you. Okay, so I have an infrared lamp. And the energy here, the infrared was flowing, and on the other side, they had another parabolic uh, mirror, and he was able to uh, focus all this infrared here at one point, and he can uh, lit a cigarette. But my question to you is: it going to the It's going to be the same radiation here flowing here than it's flowing there. One meter per one meter. Why not? No, because it's guided, it doesn't spread out. And it's going to be the same. So imagine you have water flowing, right? And you have flow water flowing in this direction here, and it's all linear. And you have little creels, you know those little creels. Okay, you, you put a net here, you're going to catch the same amount, okay? It's going to be the same amount of krill here that you get there after a while, or the same amount of water flowing, right? However, if you have a source of water, right? So if you have, like, water flowing in this direction, that direction, maybe like a fountain, it's not going to be the same here that it's going to be the same there, right? Because it's spreading out. So if you, if you have a, like a fountain, if you try to catch, uh, I don't know what is to catch in a fountain, but if you have the same net here, of course here it's going to be more than it is there. Is that clear? So here, yes. So if I ask you for the pop quiz, yes. S will be the same. The same amount of energy will flow per unit area per unit second. Ah, very good. It doesn't spread in one dimension. Now, if, because I want to get to, what am I getting to? I'm getting to the inverse square law, little by little. That's what I'm getting to. So I found, I was looking on uh, Google, trying to find, you know, the right uh, image. 
and I found this infrared uh, lamp. And you see that lamp now is going in all dimensions, in three dimensions. Do you see that? Right? It's a very small lamp and it goes in three dimensions. And if you if you ask what is it for, I, I didn't know that it uh, existed. It's for a uh, cold sore, uh, believe it or not. Like you put that on your lip if you have a cold sore and uh, it's supposed to heal. I don't know. But what is interesting is that it's going into three dimensions. It's it's quite expensive. It was like, wow, $350. So anyway, radiation now is spreading in three dimensions. Right? So if I ask you for the pop quiz now, if I put my hand here or if I put a sensor here, or if I put it here, do I get the same amount? Very good, no. Because the uh, energy that you start with here, it's spreading, diluting more and more and more and more. Do you understand? So it's 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 the same area, the same area, but the, the energy flowing through here is not going to be the same. It's gonna be less. Like no, I don't know. It it depends. I I don't know. What do what do you mean the air? Well, I don't know. I was just saying that. No, so it works. Also, maybe air will influence infrared. Maybe, right? Maybe you are gonna lose energy. You right because you're gonna heat up air on on the way. So maybe you won't get as much energy. That that's possible. You are right. So. Here, that's the point, you have a source that could be sound, that could be light, that could be infrared, or that could be radi uh, radi radi uh, radioactive isotope, and you have radiation, and you see how that radiation, it's gonna spread in three dimensions. So this is called the inverse square law. Or if you want to do like, a, a video if you want to do a, a demonstration you have a butter spray like psh, here you have a very thick layer of butter and twice the distance you're gonna have one fourth of the layer and here you have one nine of the layer right because the same amount of energy that you begin with that will be the power energy per unit second it's spreading out over a larger area is that clear? So the math here, here, if I want to find out how much energy is flowing through, I still have the same equation. That's gonna be C, and then I have uh, epsilon zero, E squared, whatever electric field here I have, because you remember, uh, an electromagnetic spectrum or radiation is made of a shaking electric field. So if I find the electric field here, I show that in my equation, or it's going to be C over mu zero B squared. So that's still B, right? Except that's still S, except that here also I have the same, but of course it's not going to be the same E and it's not going to be the same B. It's gonna be uh, larger here. But the expression is the same, is that clear? But here, S will be more, um, uh, less, I'm gonna have less energy here that I have there. Is that clear? Okay, where I'm getting to, I'm getting to that here. Okay, that's the source here. So here, I can define what it's called the power. So power will be the energy, energy per unit second, the oomph, right? So maybe you have a 100 watt light bulb. That energy is gonna spread out such as it obeys the inverse square law. So it means that the energy flowing through here, it's gonna be S equals P over four pi r square. And that's the inverse square law, okay? That means you have a distance r and 
here you're going to have less energy that you started with because that energy is diluted over a sphere. That same energy that you have here is going to spread out over a sphere. And this is the area of a sphere. So you have the relationship that the energy going through that small area per unit second equals the source here, the power, divided by 4 pi r squared. Do you understand? Example, you have a light bulb. Let's say you have a very, 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 very bright light bulb. Let's say you have a light bulb and pop quiz for next time. A hundred, no, a thousand watt light bulb. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's crazy hot, right? And now you multiply, and that will be at a distance one, say. And then you, you increase the distance. Now you are at a distance multiplied by 10. And you are located here. From your point of view, what do you see? You are not going to feel 1,000 watts, right? So if you put your, uh, if your amount of energy flowing, that's going to be 1,000 watts. 1000 joule per second now if you put your hand here so you're gonna get one ten times ten is a hundred hundred one thousand divided by a hundred ten so from your point of view here you're gonna see 10 watts. So if at a distance one, you get 1000 watts per, per unit area. So this is your hand here. At a distance one, you get 1000 watts for an area of one. So this is your hand and the area is one. And you get 1000 watts in your hand. 10 times farther away, you get only 10 watts. And that's energy flowing through your hand. Okay? So we're going to do an example, but here it's telling you the same thing. If you have the power, so that will be the total energy produced per unit second, that same energy spreading over the whole sphere. Okay, so the amount of energy that you get going through each unit square equals equals the power divided by 4 pi r squared. That should be power. So S equals the power 4 pi r squared. Okay? So let's, let's try to do this one. This one here. So now we can do it, okay? So power is the energy from the source. That power is spreading out in three dimension. And what we get here for one unit area, it's what we call S. And this is not uh, good. Like I should not put S here, it's a P here. S here stands for source. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna change my slide again. So here, sorry, this is a P here. And then if you, if you want, that's an S. So that's the source here. So you have a tiny source. So that's the total energy here. So it has some power in what? And that energy here is spreading out over a sphere, such as if you put a small area here, one meter per one meter, you get a dilution. It's not going to same amount of energy you start with. So, okay, that's the source here that will be in watt, so joule per second. And then through that little uh, area here, you're going to get less. So how much you get is going to be S 
equals epsilon zero, and then you have a C, and then you have a E square here at that location. And it's not going to be the same that you get here. And you have P power, or you get S equals whatever you start with four pi r square. Okay, so now you can do it. So do you understand what to do? So you have a power here. So that will be the total amount of energy, the oomph of the light source. It could be a star. And then the, the radiation spread out over a sphere, large area. And here you have a sensor. Maybe it's your hand. That will be how much radiation you get per unit area. So this is per unit area and per unit second and you are trying to find the power power we mean uh, the energy the energy per unit second so the total energy that you start with so Start with uh, finding S because you have E here. You have E at that location, so you can find S, right? You're doing it. So S equals 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 times 3 times 10 to the 8 times uh, 19 squared. Right, that will be S, so that will be the energy, energy per unit area and per unit second. So it's what? It's what per meter square. So what you get? Oh, you get 75 watts. Oh, you did already the computation? That's good. So, so then you, you, you already did the computation. So, okay, P equals, you write, 4 pi R squared times S, and you get 75 watts, you write. You, you can do step by step. So, first you find S, you find S, then you find power because you have the distance. Is that clear? If you do all the step, what did you get for S? Someone did the step first? Here? Thank you. So 0 0.95 watt per meter square. So that's what you get at that distance here. And then you go back to the source and you find that the power equals 4 pi r square times S. Because of course, why is that? Because you see that sphere here, the amount of energy flowing through that sphere is the same amount of energy coming from that source here. So you multiply by the number of square, and how many square do you have? 4 pi r square, because this is the area of a sphere. Is that clear? So the, the amount, total amount of energy flowing through the sphere here is the same as the power. So per unit area, you're going to get 75 watts. So the idea is the inverse square law. If, uh, if here you have 1,000 watts, you have um, the source here, you have 1,000 watts at that distance here. Here per unit area, you're going to have 1,000 divided by uh, 4, which is 250 watts. And here you're going to get 1,000 divided by 9 which is about 100 watt. Is that clear? Okay, I hope it's clear. But the idea is the inverse square law. You multiply the distance by 2, 
the energy going through each unit area is divided by 4. If you multiply the distance by 3, every energy, the energy flowing through every area is divided by 9. So you will remember when you adjust your lamp, if you are going into physical therapy, if you multiply the distance by 2, the, the, the heat that you get here, if it's in, really in 3D, should be divided by 4. Uh, a little bit less than 4 because it doesn't spread in the three dimension, but that's the idea. Okay, the idea is to be able to compute how much energy is heating the skin here, given the, the source here that you start with. Okay, let's, let's try to do that. So the, the sun, the sun, that's the power of a sun. So the sun is like a light bulb and it's its energy is 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watt, so joule per second. How much radiation do you get on Earth? And on Earth, the distance to the Earth is 150 million kilometers away. If you want to be discreet, and that's not good, right? <laughs> okay, then. so you have the sun. And it's a, uh, it has energy, it has oomph. That's what we say, oomph, you know, a lot of energy here. How much energy is like a light bulb? of 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watt. That means joule, joule per second. So it means every second, that's how much energy is leaving the sun. And then it's spread out. So when, once it's reached the earth, of course, lucky for us, you don't get that much, right? You're gonna get less. So let's say this is the earth here. This is the earth. And we, we take a area one meter per one meter, and we want to know how much energy do we get here. And you know that the distance between the earth and the sun, the distance is 150 million, million kilometer. Okay, can you do that now? And one kilometer is a thousand meter. So the distance is 1.5 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, or 11, 11. Eleven meters. So how much energy is going through that little square here? Can you do it? So power, or we can say S, how much energy through that little square, S equals power, and then you divide by the all area, which is a sphere, four pi r squared. Okay, so you have the same amount of energy that you start with, and now it's crossing out an invisible sphere. Okay, it's a sphere, and the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So that's why you write it this way. So what do you get? Yeah. What? Uh, what per meter square? Very good. So S equals thirteen forty four, something like that. What per meter square? It's about let's say you lose to heat. 
like from to the atmosphere about something very famous how much energy do we get from the sun on average is about 1000 watt per meter square so it means you take a super efficient solar panel outside one meter is about one arm one yard one meter per one meter and you have all those uh, uh, semiconductor whatever and you want to produce electricity you want to produce electricity ideally you should be able to get 1000 watts so 1000 joule per second this is not very efficient you cannot run miami with that okay to run miami you need one gigawatt and here we're talking about one kilowatt so solar energy plus of course you need the sun doesn't really work turbines don't work either it's not very efficient right you lose a lot so anyway, but it works well for small uh, um, house, for example, that, that's cool. Okay, like uh, if you go camping, you need a, a generator. So it's, it's good to know those kind of things because if you want to buy a generator, a, 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 a solar, solar based, you have to understand the what business. So one meter per one meter, it's gonna give you 1000 watts, okay? That will be the amount of energy we get on Earth. Of course, if the Earth is a little bit closer, we're going to get more or less what? More, but we're going to grill. And if it's a little bit farther away, we're going to freeze. So it's like the perfect distance. On Earth, we have an average uh, temperature of 15 Celsius, okay, it's great for life, yay. But that's our source of energy here. Okay, so I wanted to, to make that clear. I think last time I got, uh, I didn't know how to explain it. I think it's better. Is it better? Good. I'm happy. So then uh, inverse square law works for a lot of things. It doesn't just work for light. Okay, it works for sound when you are screaming, for example, of course, you move away, the, the, the intensity of the scream, it's going to be diluted if it's in three dimensions. It works for radiation. If you have a radioactive uh, component like uranium, you multiply the distance by three, the radiation you are exposed to is going to be divided by nine. And when they did this experiment in the... Um, Fort Alamo, Alamo. Well, they did experiment during the, the, the World War II with a plutonium bomb. There were some uh, terrible accidents. The, the person who was building the plutonium bomb, you know, experimenting, he was exposed to so much radiation. He got radiation sickness. He was the first one. You can look it up, right? I think it's, it was Fort, Fort Alamo. They were doing those experiments. So he was bu building a brick wall against the core of the plutonium bomb right by accident they were young you know reckless they were genius nevertheless he 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 dropped the brick on, on on the floor and he was exposed to so much radiation that he died in a few days of radiation sickness that was the first case but my point is that his colleagues who were a few feet away they didn't die why they didn't die Be because Exactly, because of the inverse square law. It takes only a few feet to dilute all the radiation. So a few feet away, the, the, the radiation, like, a, like three feet away, the radiation will be divided by nine. So his colleagues who were in the same room, but a further away, they didn't die. So if you're interested, it's an interesting story because he was so passionate about science. As he was dying, as he was dying, he was writing all his symptoms because it was the first time someone died from radiation sickness. So what is the what are the symptoms of radiation sickness? It's the same symptom that someone has, God forbid, chemotherapy. You know how it's terrible, you know how sick you are, you vomit and you, you have a diarrhea and it's, it's terrible. Chemotherapy is a terrible thing. It's like poisoning, right? I'm, I'm not 
telling if it's good or not. I'm just telling you the symptoms. So radiation sickness, it's this. It's it's like chemotherapy on steroids. So it was the first case. But my point is the radiation works exactly the same the same way. Okay. So now we can uh, we can go back to our business. So gamma rays, it's a very small, very 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 small uh, wavelength, so small that it can destroy your cell, coming to radiation sickness, because it will burp out all the energy inside the cells, the human cell, because it has a wavelength smaller than the human cell, so it can totally destroy it. Too much of it, you 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 don't even have time to to develop cancer. You just die, right? So those gamma rays are emitted for for example from a nuclear reaction. So if you have a fission reaction, you know you break uranium in two, you're gonna emit uh, gamma rays. So what's interesting about gamma rays and uh, how how come we use it for PET scan? Again, if you if you take a chemistry class, maybe maybe you know this guy here. You know what it is? So you know this one. This one is an electron. And what is this one? I don't know if we can say this. It's a, no, it's not a proton. It's an anti-electron. So it smells like an electron. It looks like an electron. It talks like an electron, but it's positively charged. So we call that a non-electron. And what's going to happen? I'm going to put it here like this. What's going to happen when non-electron meet an electron? Okay, they're going to annihilate each other, and they will destroy each other, and they're going to emit gamma rays. So all matter becomes pure energy. And you're going to burp out gamma ray here and gamma ray there because you have conservation of momentum. So if you burp in one way, someone has to burp in, I mean, someone has to be burped out in the other way when you have an anti electron and an electron. So you might think, okay, this is science fiction. It's not science fiction because actually we use it for PET scan. So in a PET scan, you make radioisotope, let's say you make oxygen, uh, I think oxygen 15 or 18, I forgot. I think oxygen 15, for example, is radioactive, so it's a radioisotope, so it's not stable. When it's going to decay, it's going to become something else, but it's going to burn out anti-electron. So let's say you want to see if someone, God forbid, has a tumor. So has a brain here, you want to see with very good resolution if there is a tumor. So you're going to feed the person some food here. And with oxygen, oxygen likes to go to the brain. So you, you feed the patient some, some um, food with radioactive oxygen. So right away, it's going to go to the brain. In the brain, it's going to emit a positron, right? But in your brain, do you have positron? No, because you have matter, right? So you have a lot of electron. So inside the brain, what's going to happen when, when oxygen will decay in a positron? The electron of your brain are going to be, what's going to happen? Destroy. And you're going to burp, it's going to burp out gamma ray. That's what happened. That's a PET scan. Okay, you feed the person or you feed the patient radioisotope that will decay, emit positron. The positron will combine with the electron inside you and you are highlighted by gamma rays from inside out. Okay, and all over you have a, a computer that will detect that and you have a very good resolution of what's going on in your brain. If you have a tumor, God forbid, you have a very good resolution. So if you want to do surgery, then you know if you can do it or if you cannot do it. Sometimes you cannot do it, right? So it's all about risk and benefit. 
Of course, there is a risk. Is there a risk? Of course, there is a risk. You are exposed to gamma rays. But maybe you don't have choice because you need to see what's going on inside. So that's how a PET scan works. And uh, that's why I told you, so positron, electron combined together, it's going to emit gamma rays. So if you, if, um, you, you have all kinds of radioisotopes, depending on what you want to see. So if you want to see tissue, for example, maybe you're going to use radioactive um, carbon. Oxygen will be for the brain. And I don't know all of them. It depends what, what in the body you are trying to look at. How do you make those radioisotopes? You use a cyclotron, OK? And we connect the dots, right? You have a proton. You accelerate the proton with an electric field. You deflect. You go faster, faster, faster. You use the proton as a projectile. You hit nitrogen, for example, and that will emit a radioisotope, which is unstable, carbon-11. Carbon-11, you give that to the patient. It goes inside the body somewhere you want. It's going to emit a positron that will combine with electron, and you will be highlighted by gamma rays. Is that interesting for those going into medical school, for example? That's super interesting. And uh, or, or working, you know, in uh, like I had last semester, I had a, a student's uh, and and her job was uh, um, do, doing. Uh, Working with radioisotope to um, to for 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 the doctor to study the theory. So oxygen fifteen is for the brain. Carbon is for biological compound. I have links here if you want to uh, go into it. Iodine, for example, is for the theory. So a lot of cancer here happening. So you you can use that to to see what's going on. But the main, main idea is that if you want to look at a very good resolution, you need to use a wavelength smaller than the thing that you are trying to look. So if you do a PET scan, you're going to see very well, a very good resolution. If you do MRI, of course, it's safer because you are exposed to radio wave, but you won't get the same resolution. So it's always like a balance between risk and benefit. Okay, what, what are you trying to do? A PET scan, you have a SPECT scan. So in that case, instead of being highlighted from inside out, you are using bouncing up. Okay, you bounce up and you are highlighting also the inside. The resolution is not that uh, good, but it's, um, it's cheaper. And the radio isotope, you don't need to do to make them at the hospital with a cyclotron. You can import them. Okay, are you with me? Right? Should be interesting because you are in uh, health or biology. So a lot of application into that. In uh, in space, space, you have a lot of uh, gamma rays. We call that gamma ray burst. And uh, recently, you have like. Um, Like a few days ago, they, they were able to uh, detect a gamma ray burst hitting the, the Earth, right? And, and so it's, it's a gamma ray uh, coming beam coming from space. And that happens when you have a black hole that, um, that, that just happens. So it could happen when you have a massive star collapsing on itself and it becomes a black hole. In that case, it's going to burp out like a burp of gamma ray. Or it could happen like you have two neutron stars merging together and it becomes a black hole and you have also a burp of gamma ray. Or it can happen when you have a black hole and neutron star orbiting each other, merging together in the, two in the new black hole and you have a burst of gamma ray. So some, some scientists think that maybe life has evolved, right? the way it evolved. Maybe it's also because some gamma rays uh, happened in the past. Maybe it triggers some evolution. We don't know. 
but that was in the news like recently okay i i just had that article we, we got hit by that They, they say it was a, a huge one. They call that the brightest of all time, the boat. The boat. So uh, I, I, I don't know the consequence. If you want uh, extra credit, you can uh, look it up, try to find out is there consequence or what, what happened with that. So I, I don't know what the consequence of that is. They, they just detected very recently. And yes, we were uh, detected by that. And you see that energy doesn't spread out too much. So you cannot uh, use 4 pi r squared, right? Because if that doesn't spread over a sphere, it's kind of focused here, very focused. Are you with me? And then you have uh, X-ray. X-ray come next, so smaller wavelength. Still not very good. You don't want to be exposed to too much X-ray. And it connects to what we have learned previously. If you have a cathode ray tube, for example, you're going to apply a voltage. And if you have a voltage, you have an electric field. If you have an electric field and electrons, the electric field will speed up the electrons. Remember that? So you remember how I asked you, uh, oh, Pirates. So um, kinetic energy equals potential energy. So EV equals one half mv squared. Do you remember that? So anyway, all that kinetic energy here will be turned into X-ray. So what's happening? You the electrons are going to speed up, and here they crash into a metal target, very heavy metal. So all that energy lost by the electron that comes from the voltage is going to turn into x-rays are, are you going to join the pirates leaving us <laughs> like everyone is leaving us it's a machinery don't go So it comes from the voltage, right? So by by um, tuning the voltage, you can have soft X-ray or hard X-ray. So that's kind of stuff. If you become a technician, you learn, you know, you, you have to tune the voltage right to make the right X-ray. So again, high voltage, the electron are speeding up crashes they crash in a metal target and you're gonna burp out x-ray the the way it's it's really explained it's because the electron kick out electron from their orbit and and so you have available orbit and higher up electron take the place of those electrons that have been kicked out so you're gonna burp out so anyway you learn in chemistry that electrons are in energy uh, shell, right? Energy level. So if you go from a high level to a low level, you can burp out a huge amount of energy if the step is very high. So that's what's happening here. So that will be X-ray. Uh, uh, discovered by chance in 1895 by Kant Röntgen, German, obviously. Right. On good. So 1895, he, he was experimenting with the vacuum uh, tube here, doing some experiment. And just by chance, you know, he he experimented on, on his wife, of course, right? Not as him. And uh, wow, holy moly, that, that, was, that was the result here. I found the X-ray with a photographic film and you see the bones. And he said at the time, have seen my own death because it was the first time that living living a uh, man could see the inside okay it was very weird so if you um if you google it it's interesting so it's a very famous quote i've seen my own death and it was by chance How would a vacuum tube that's that's from there. 
that's 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 here. So you speed up the electron. Electron have kinetic energy, and then they crash. So it's like something crashing, right? When you crash, that energy has to go somewhere, right? Radiation is a form of that energy. Radiation is a form of energy. So all that kinetic energy turn into radiation, exactly. So if you increase the voltage, you're going to increase the frequency of the X-ray, and you have hard X-ray. If you decrease the voltage, so you decrease the energy, you decrease the frequency, you have soft X-ray. So it's that conservation of energy because X-ray, infrared, UV, it's radiation and it has energy, right? So if you take a small cube here, a unit area that you cut out, you can find how much energy, but you're going to have more energy in X-ray than you have in infrared. Is that clear? Okay, so here, very suspicious of any new medical finding that, that they have. At the time, they didn't understand how dangerous X-ray could be. So they will sell you, you know, oh, you have a headache? Come, be exposed to X-ray and your headache with guarantee will be gone. It was worse than that if you have a sniffle, right? If you had a cold, right? You don't like to blow your nose. Do not worry, you know, exposed to X-ray and you have a clear nose. Of course it was working because X-ray destroyed pathogen, you know, so all your bacteria in your nose, right? Clear out. But of course you can uh, get cancer. <laughs> it was not a good idea. Whoops. It did work. I don't know for headache. I don't know for headache that you have to uh, Google it, but uh, you see, it, it's true, okay? And I'm not making thing, thing up. It says, give the leave in 15 minutes. So you have a migraine, go under the X-ray, and your migraine is gone. Maybe it worked, I don't know. But of course, it's going to increase the probability to get cancer. So do not believe everything they say. <laughs> Um, that that was uh, someone's uh, that that was in the news also. So it's um, with X-ray we can see through. So that's a story that was in the news. I don't know if you know, but part of Morocco, for example, is part of Spain, belongs to Spain. So the the people from Morocco wants to go to Spain because, of course, once you are in Spain, you you have access to Europe because it's the European Union. So they, they found a child in a suitcase. And, and, and this is, of course, very bad because the amount of X-ray exp you expose the, the person is too, too high, OK? So the, the, the point is that you, you, there is even an equation to find what's going to be the probability for you to get cancer if you are exposed to that much of uh, radiation. I'll show you the equation. So that was something I found in the news here. Not a very bad idea, 1950s, okay? So don't believe whatever they say <laughs> sometimes. 1950s, it was so cool. So we, we are not talking about the 19th century, okay? We are talking about the 1950s, right? My my parents' time. And you go to shoe a uh, shoe store and you will find those boxes and what, you will put your feet inside and you will be exposed to X-ray because X-ray were so cheap to make. Once you make a, a voltage, electricity, electricity is dirt cheap, you, ca you can make X-ray and people would see their, their bones inside. So imagine how excited the kids were, you know? They were in the shoe store, put their feet inside and they could see their bones and you wiggle the toes, that's all so cool. However, bad, bad idea, okay? Because you are exposed to too much radiation. We, we, can, uh, we can make a computation how much probability. So when cancer, when we talk about cancer, when we talk about side effect of any kind of radiation or medicine, you always talk about probability. Okay, so for example, you, 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 chemotherapy, we were talking about chemotherapy, you talk about the probability to get better or the probability to get worse. So it's always probability. 
So there, there is a unit here, it's called the REM. REM is gonna, it's, it's gonna tell you how much destruction you do, you, you do to the biological tissue. Okay, so it's just a unit to find out how much biological tissue you are killing. Okay, so then you have something called the linear hypothesis. So what's the linear hypothesis is going to give you the probability to get cancer if you are exposed to that much of radiation. So it works like this, okay? Pop quiz question here because it's a very easy computation to do. If you are exposed to one REM, one REM, so that will be the amount of radiation you are exposed to, it's like a unit, the chance to get cancer is one out of 2,500. So it means if you have 2,500 people getting one REM, one out of the 2,500 will get cancer. Those shoebox, yeah, it's not shoebox, but they, they were X-ray machine, so people could see if the, the shoes were fitting well. They gave people 30 REM. What, what was the probability to get cancer? Very good, that's 30 out of 1200, uh, uh, 2500, right? Yes? So how much is that? Yes, very good, 1.2%. So uh, uh, what's here? Okay, 1.2%. Okay, 1.2% to get cancer chance to get cancer. So then you say, oh, it's no big deal. Okay, let's find out. 100,000 people put their feet in this machine. How many of them will get cancer? Yes, very good, 1,200, right? 1.2 out of 100 is X out of 100,000. So that's going to be 1,200 people will get cancer. But it's 1.2% 1, 1. is not a lot, but 1,200, you know, you don't want to be among them. You see how it works? So this computation, it's called the linear hypothesis, and you measure the probability to get cancer given um, REM, so the amount of radiation. Interestingly, like, uh, and th that comes from a book which is called Physics, Physics for Future President. I guess none of our presidents read that book. It's a very interesting book. It, it, it talks uh, about the uh, physics behind the headline, Richard Muller. It's very interesting. Physics for Future President, very interesting book. And he taught at Berkeley University. So anyway, if interestingly, if you go to Colorado, if you go to Colorado, Denver, right? Denver, Colorado, you are exposed to a lot of REM because the, the ground in Colorado has a lot of uh, uranium, so have a lot of uh, radioactivity. But people don't get more cancer. That's because if, if you get to one REM or below one REM, the body has evolved in such a way he knows it knows how to deal with radiation. So you don't have more cancer in uh, Colorado that you get here, for example. Okay, that means that uh, computation works only above one REM. And then the body takes over, he knows, he knows how to fix DNA, for example. Isn't that interesting? You're right, you're right, anti-cancer. By, by, by the way, there is an amazing book, it's called uh, Tripping Over the Truth, if you are interested about cancer, Tripping Over the Truth. And uh, actually, it uh, explained that cancer is really a metabolic disease. So it has to do with the mitochondria. And uh, yes, we, we should be, our immune system should be able to fight cancer, right? 
So in anyway, it's a paroptosis here. And then we have a CAT scan. So CAT scan, the way it works, it looks like a PET scan, okay? So it means you can get very good image like in three dimensions. So it means you have X-ray going in one direction, the other direction, this direction, that direction, and you get what is called tomography, right? So you have computer all around here, and you can have a very good image with a CAT scan. So everywhere it's the first step, and then they cannot see, they send you for a CAT scan, they cannot see, so maybe they get, will send you for a PET scan. CAT scan, of course it's X-ray, so there is a risk and a benefit a balance, and that like love kitties. So that's also in the news, I found that was interesting to put that in my slides. That was a couple of years ago, I was uh, teaching for a, uh, a uh, nuclear medicine student. So one student gave me this. It's it's interesting. Um, they they did a CAT scan of a, what it's called a Buddha. Okay, it's a Buddha, and and the the, the monk inside. Have you heard of that? Did you did you know that? So it it was a practice that they had. So they were not killed. It's voluntarily, willingly. They they will just starve to death. Before doing that, they will take um, some tea to cleanse. Like you know how we take magnesium today? <laughs> so they, they will have kind of the same thing to cleanse everything, right? And then they will wait for death. And then they will show them inside here. So it's like mummified, dry up. And I think they, it's forbidden to do that now. I, I think it's from Tibet. I'm not sure where they come from, They're, but they are monks. They are monks, right? So it's interesting. They did a CAT scan. They didn't want to damage whatever was inside, and they could uh, study. Isn't that interesting? So cool. Uh, now you have also something called backscatter X-ray, which is very much like a SPECT. Uh, you remember the SPECT scan bounce back? Ultrasound also works the same way. Okay, you can bounce back. And you can see what whatever is inside. So back scatter X-ray. It's when the X-ray bounces back, and you, you can see inside. So here it comes also from the book uh, Physics for Future President, and uh, and 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 uh, it it was uh, they use back X-ray to to see what was inside the truck to see if you have illegal immigrants. And of course, it's controversial, okay? You can say it's good, or you can say, you know, is, is it okay to do that when people, they don't know that they're exposed to X-ray? So it's uh, it's open to discussion, but here I'm just showing you the physics, right? You can see whatever is inside because of the X-ray back skater. In China, they used to do it. I don't know if they're still doing it, but when you came to China, you will uh, hand your passport, up there and they will back x-ray you without you knowing it uh, to see if you are carrying weapons right so i don't know if it's very ethical or not yeah so except for a metal detector it's it's not um they do it by induction with a metal detector right do they do it with X-ray when you enter the machine like this? It's a good question. Do they use X-ray? I'm not sure. Metal detector, you use uh, electromagnetic uh, induction. It's possible. I don't know. Do they use X-ray? They use X-ray. Yeah. I'm sure they are careful with the doors, I will hope, but uh, I don't know if they, no one knows when when you go like this at the airport, is it X-ray? I'm not sure, let's, let's find out. 